Uh, good evening to all of you and a, a very warm Wits welcome uh, to this inaugural lecture by Professor Bruno Tunnel. My name is Professor Garth Stevens. I am the Deputy Vice Chancellor for People Development and Culture uh, and normally responsible for overseeing all matters related to the professoriate in the Faculty of Commerce, Law and Management. And so it's truly a pleasure to be with you all this evening at this inaugural lecture by Professor Tainel from the School of Economics and Finance. Uh, let me take this opportunity to formally acknowledge all of you here tonight on behalf of the university uh, and as members of the Witz community, as colleagues, as students, as friends, and of course as family members uh, of Professor Tainel. And then Bruno himself, of course, a warm, warm welcome to you. I'd also like to acknowledge the presence of our Pro-Vice-Chancellor, Professor Imran Velodia, uh, and I'd like to welcome in particular Professor Jason Cohen, the Dean of the Faculty of Commerce, Law and Management, the Head of School, Professor Uma Kolampurambal, who will also deliver the vote of thanks, and as I've indicated already, our inaugurating professor. Tonight is a very special moment when the university formally publicly and very proudly acknowledges the personal achievements of a scholar as he or she attains the highest rank, the apex of an academic within the university, the rank of the full professor. This is really an opportunity for us to acknowledge their achievements, not only in the university, but also in the broader public domain. And so the inaugural lecture is really open to any member of the public to share in the knowledge and the scholarship and the wisdom of the inaugurating professor. And so, again, a warm welcome to all of you here. I know we're not streaming this live uh, tonight, but I know that it is being recorded. And so for those of you who are watching the recording, a warm welcome to, to all of you too. This is a moment when we can acknowledge that this achievement, of course, is also never purely about the professor him or herself. It is reflective of immense amounts of investment, support, mentorship, sacrifice, care, that has been shown by colleagues, collaborators, families, and friends alike. And so we use this opportunity, uh, Professor Tanel, to collectively share in this moment with you and to celebrate with a communal sense of pride in this achievement that you, as one of our own, has attained. And that uh, also reflects upon us, of course, as a community. We look forward to celebrating with you and experiencing your thoughts and your insights this evening. The inaugural lecture normally involves a full professor sharing uh, with colleagues and the broader public their body of work or the future of their work or a combination of these. And so even though it often brings with it a sense of anticipation for the inaugurating professor in many instances, uh, I, I often say this to inaugurating professors, it feels like a hazing all over again, like you're being initiated all over again, even though you've been a full professor for some time and you've been professing for some time. Uh, and so it can be a little bit anxiety provoking, but really this is an opportunity for us to hear your thoughts, to share in your wisdom, like I said, uh, but also just to, to celebrate with you actually. And so I do hope that you're going to have a little bit of fun this evening, sharing with us your presentation on public debt dynamics between finance, macroeconomics, and politics. And just remember, Professor Tynell, everybody who's here really wants to be here because they actually care about you and what it is that you have to say. So please do enjoy the event, and we look forward to celebrating with you. Without belaboring my uh, opening remarks any further, let me now formally call on the Dean of the Faculty of Commerce, Law, and Management, Professor Jason Cohen, to introduce our inaugurating professor. Professor Cohen. Thanks very much, Deputy Vice-Chancellor. Good evening, friends and colleagues. A very special warm welcome to this professorial inauguration. And of course, a warm welcome to Bruno, who's the focus of all our attentions tonight, um, and to his family. Thanks for joining us on this auspicious occasion. Uh, as Professor Stevens mentioned, we have an opportunity tonight to celebrate Bruno's elevation to the position of full professor at WITS and for Bruno to share his knowledge with us and his views on this topic of public debt dynamics. Before we get to that though, I have the privilege of introducing Bruno and sharing with you um, 
his research interests and his inspiring academic journey um, tonight. Bruno's very first research paper was completed in 1995 during his fourth year of study and was focused on experimental economics applied to coordination games. He then defended his thesis in the year 2000 at, you're gonna to have to forgive my French, the Lumiere Lyon II University, where he received a solid uh, theoretical education, particularly in monetary theory and general equilibrium theory. This was the first time a doctoral thesis in contemporary economic thought had been defended in France. His early work centered on the emergence of microeconomic theories of contracts and wage relations. This research highlighted the implicit debates and connections between, on the one hand, the core of neoclassical theory and different approaches, such as radical political economics in the United States inspired by institutionalism, Keynesianism, and Marxism. He published three articles based on this research in La Revue Economique, Papers in Political Economy, and Economia, and a first book on radical political economics published in 2004. Recruited by Paris One Pantheon Sorbonne University in 2002, Bruno applied his theoretical knowledge, along with three other colleagues, to the relationship between wage labor and interfirm subcontracting relationships, combining several business and social databases. This research resulted in a series of articles and book chapters and led to collaboration with the National Institute of Statistics in France to improve the, the nomenclature and quality of data collected. Some of the research findings were presented by, Bu by Bruno during a visit to WITS in 2014. In parallel with that empirical research, Bruno was also participating in an interdisciplinary research project involving other researchers in social sciences as well as life sciences on the unity of science. This project in epistemology and philosophy of science brought him to South Africa for the first time for a series of research seminars in Stellenbosch in 2007. Although the first part of his career focused on microeconomic and methodological questions, Bruno has been interested in financial macroeconomics and international finance since the beginning of his studies. He read Keynes's general theory in his second year and worked extensively in his fourth year on Benassi and Mellenvode's disequilibrium macroeconomics, which contributed to the emergence of the micro foundations of neo-Keynesian Keynesian macroeconomics. Bruno was finally able to further explore this field starting in 2004 when he took over the second year course in budget and taxation economics, which became a course in macroeconomics applied to public finance, making extensive use of national accounting data. This resulted in a series of academic papers starting in 2006, appearances in written press and radio media, and as Bruno laments, but not in television and a book in 2016 on public debt dynamics. In the same year, he co-edited a book on the CFA Franc that revived debates about France's role in Africa. In 2020, he published a report on public expenditure and a book on the same topic in 2021. Bruno is currently working on a new version of his book on public debt, this time in English, He's also involved in a project with his former doctoral student, Elise Kremer, on the role of contingent convertible bonds in macro financial instability, with the first public paper published already in 2022. Additionally, he continues a collaboration with Michael Rafferty of um, uh, uh, Royal Mel Melbourne Institu uh, Institute of Technology on the effects of financialization in the non-financial sphere. Finally, in the coming months, he will complete an ongoing project on economic history with Nicholas Pinsard from the University of Lille that is expected to result in a book on royal finances in 16th century France. In 2013, Bruno defended his habilitation at Paris One Pantheon Sorbonne University, a postdoctoral thesis and the highest academic degree in continental Europe that plays an important role in the continental system for becoming a professor. In addition to his academic activities, Bruno has been involved in research 
Um, I'm sorry, I think I've moved your slides there. Um, Bruno has been involved in research organization and the promotion of pluralism within his discipline. He has been elected to various positions at his university in Paris and at the national level since the beginning of his career. He was involved in the creation of the French Journal of Socioeconomics in 2008, which has become indispensable in the French-speaking landscape. He also played a key role in the founding of the French Association for Political Economy in 2009, where he served as secretary and then treasurer until 2017. Finally, he was an active member, alongside Ben Fine and many others, in the launch of the International Initiative for Promoting Political Economy. Today, Bruno is delighted, as we are, to continue his career at WITS, having been recruited by us for his profile as a generalist macroeconomist covering both mainstream and so-called non-standard approaches. In his time here, he, along with Michael Sachs, has initiated a macroeconomics reading group. Over the past few months, he has written a paper on state capture for the Brook Project edited by Temba Maseko and Jonathan Clarin um, within our faculty. Additionally, he is preparing two edited books, and last year he contributed to the establishment of a joint PhD program between WITS and SOAS in London, whose first cohort began in September. Friends and colleagues and family of Bruno, without further ado, I would like to welcome Professor Tinnell to the podium. Good evening, everyone. It's a great honor for me to be with you tonight. I would like to begin by paying tribute to Vishnu Padayache. I knew him very little, but it is somewhat, somewhat thanks to him that uh, our South African adventure began. I want to thank Professor Ben Fine for supporting me in this project. I would like to take this opportunity to pay tribute to my parents for the education they provided a long time ago, for the trust they placed in me, and for allowing me to pursue higher education. They supported me greatly, both morally and financially. I want to express my gratitude to Alice Martin, my partner. None of this could have happened without her support, and you have made enormous sacrifices for us to be here. I also want to thank my three sons, Colleen, Zachary, and Milo. I have taken you on a strange adventure. Uh, I know it's not always easy for you either, especially dealing with me. <laughs> I apologize to you for my lack of availability and, for, and, uh, and all my flaws. I am happy to share this extraordinary experience of leaving our country to live in South Africa for several years. I know this will mark us for the rest of uh, our lives, help us grow, and uh, make us better people. I want to thank the professors who trained me in Lyon, my thesis advisor, Professor Pierre Doquès, my lifelong friends and colleagues, Jérôme Moucourant, Étienne Boisserie, Nicolas Ponsvignon and Michael Rafferty. I also thank my colleagues from, and friends from uh, Paris 1, Panthéon Sorbonne, Nadine Tevno, Julie, Va Julie Valentin, Corinne Perraudin and Muriel Pucci, and from the French Association of Political Economy from whom I have learned so much. Thank you also to my students and PhD students from whom I have also learned a great deal. I would also like to express my gratitude to my colleagues at WITS who are present here for their uh, warm welcome, especially Professor Uma Colomparambil, our head of school, and Professor Jason Cohen, our dean. Thanks also to Professor Garth Stevens and those who helped me prepare this lecture. Thanks to Professor Im Imran Valodia. Thanks to all my friends in the audience and thanks to everyone else who has come to listen to this lecture tonight. I also have a thought for those who couldn't be here tonight, but who have encouraged and supported me since my arrival. Now I have a little joke. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
I'm supposed not to, to, to laugh of my own jokes. Um, so considering the results uh, of the rugby match yesterday, uh, it's going to be less painful for you guys to listen to my accent. <laughs> Thank you. So now I'm running late. I have too many things to say, so I'm going to speak very fast. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> so I decided to write something new for you tonight on my favorite subject, public debt dynamics, and I know I'm not only addressing economists. Those who expect, who expect a solution to South African problems related to public debt of the kind do this, and you will get that, will be disappointed. I apologize for that in advance. I do not claim to replace policymakers to tell them what to do. Public finance regularly make headlines in the media in many countries. Public debt has risen too much. It must be reduced. We often read a vast majority agree on reducing public debt, public debt including those in government. And what about economists? They often agree with the idea that public debt should be reduced and that it can be dangerous. But most of them see shades of gray. For them, it's hard to do without public debt. But if it becomes too large, it can become destabilizing and challenge the state's capacity to fulfill its sovereign roles. Faced with a high or rising public debt, many governments implement uh, austerity policies. In our jargon, sorry, I try to manage both. Um, yeah, we call this consolidation. The principle is simple. One would only have to apply the good management principles to the state uh, that apply to businesses. This seems logical. Adjust uh, spending levels to revenue levels so that debt cannot increase thus uh, targeting a zero deficit. In a more subtle version of consolidation, one looks at the sustainability of public debt by comparing it to GDP. So we use the notion of debt to GDP ratio. It's necessary, it's necessary to reduce it in absolute terms. Sorry, it's not necessary to reduce it in absolute terms. It's enough that the debt to GDP ratio decreases. In other words, an increase in public debt can be accepted provided it's slower than GDP growth. In this case, good public management means ensuring that expenditure in nominal terms grows slower than nominal GDP because public revenues tend to follow GDP movements. Okay, but uh, the question is, is this really working? Does austerity really reduces, reduce sorry, uh, the debt to GDP ratio successfully? The European uh, experience of the uh, 2010s, uh, despite historically low interest rates and the South African experience since 2012, make us doubt. Why such a failure? This is what we are going to see now. The semantics of debt is marked by negativity, yet when managed cautiously, debt also offers extraordinary economic potential and this is also what we are going to see now. Modern societies would exi wouldn't exist without it. As without money, there would be no debt either. Sorry, without debt, there would be no money either. <laughs> we will address some of these questions from the perspective of the counterparts of uh, public debt. Why austerity doesn't work? Let's now turn to the state's uh, budget constraint and begin by understanding why austerity doesn't work. Here is the budget constraint of the government and here is uh, what it means. Uh, a change in the debt to GDP ratio is the result of the debt service of the current year and the deficit as a percentage of the GDP of the current year. For, for austerity to work, we would need to simply lower the gross rate of uh, government spending to a, lower, to a level below that of uh, GDP. 
In this case, tax revenues would cover both debt service and other expenses. However, there is a deus ex machina in that, um, in that to, to work, economic growth. On one hand, growth must be high enough to at least cover debt servicing, or you would have to significantly reduce nominal government spending, which works even less. On the other hand, the slowdown in government spending implied by austerity should not have an impact on growth and tax receipts. In other words, the GDP growth uh, resulting from private spending and exports must be dynamic enough for, for it to work. Therefore, the country must be internationally competitive and domestic private demand must also be strong and independent of government spending. But what happens if, uh, if growth is, uh, sorry, positively depends on government spending, which is empirically validated, and we'll go back to this uh, with regard to the multiplier. We can rewrite the budget constraint as you can see it on the screen. And then it makes it a bit more complicated, but I'm going to comment on it. And in this case, uh, it is an entirely different story because the objective to achieve is not just moving, it's not just a moving target, but it's an endogenous target. This means that it moves in response to the movements of the tool used to aim at it. At it. Indeed, in the scenario where economic growth positively depends on government spending, with austerity, as government spending slows down, it also slows down, slows down GDP, which in turn slows down public revenues, maintaining the, de the deficit and causing the debt-to-GDP um, debt ratio to continue increasing, possibly at an even faster rate. And the debt service increases as well. This means that the debt sustainability deteriorates. This is the fundamental reason why austerity consolidation does not achieve uh, its stated goal of improving debt sustainability. It creates a vicious circle of indebtedness. Let's discuss now the adventures of the multiplier and the birth of the first synthesis in macroeconomics. Macroeconomic thought uh, has seen significant shift over the past 100 years, and their impact on economic policy has been substantial. Macroeconomics was born from Keynesian theory. The general theory was published in uh, 1936. And what is known as the first synthesis from uh, Keynesian theory, sorry, um, sorry, what is known as the first synthesis emerged as early in, as uh, 1937, thanks to John Hicks, and it bridged uh, the gap between Keynesian theory and the neoclassical theory, incorporating key insight, insights from Keynesian economics into the neoclassical theory. In particular, the multiplier discovered by Richard Kahn in uh, 1931 played a central role. The idea is uh, quite simple. Economic growth is positively dependent on changes in autonomous demand as explained in uh, this line you can read on the screen. Its meaning is as follows. An increase in autonomous expenditure of one rand leads to an increase in GDP of more than one rand. In the case where the multiplier is uh, equal to one, uh, is bigger than one. Behind this principle is the idea that uh, multiplier or diffusion effects occur because of spending. I spend more, then you get more, so you spend more in turn, etc. And this happens massively uh, uh, in the world economy, and it has a macro effect. For Keynes, an economy left to itself leads to insufficient autonomous demand to efficiently utilize productive resources. In the absence of autonomous ex public expenditure, then what do we have left? We, we have only uh, private investment and exports. Exports depend largely on demand from our trading partners. So uh, this is uh, something that over which uh, the government has limited influence. Private investment, on the other hand, depends on the state of confidence, as Keynes used to say, and the animal spirits, it's also from Keynes. 
of capitalists, investors, entrepreneurs, and innovators. That is, it depends on that spirit of enterprise that goes beyond rationality, in which investors embark on new projects by betting on the future in an attempt to make money, of course, but also for the love of adventure. The problem is, what these, is that these bets are risky and the future is inherently uncertain. So private investment remains most of the time at an insufficient level to create an economic boom capable of utilizing a higher level of productive capacity and absorbing available labor that cannot find employment at the current uh, wage. Keynes' innovation was to show that the government can influence autonomous expenditure, particularly through public investment. This has two effects. Increased growth through the multiplier uh, and boosting private investment due to uh, improved growth prospects, increased confidence and expectations. It creates, it creates a crowding in effect on private and private investments. Public and private investments are complementary. In short, good economic uh, policy involves using the mechanism, um, this mechanism, when the output gap is significant, meaning the economy is far from its uh, growth potential. The problem with this tool is that it's very effective. It works so well that the economy can overheat, inflation can accelerate, as, and as unemployment decreases, worker become less compliant, demanding higher wages, going on strike more easily, and disrupting business operation, which is not always good for profits. Furthermore, as full employment approaches, capitalists effectively lose control over the, play, the pace of accumulation as the state then drives the course of economic progress. And we know that from Kaletsky in a very good paper written in 1943. Therefore, there is a trade-off between, on the one hand, an economy that grows too slowly, resulting in high levels of unemployment, which is easier to govern, but at both the micro and the macro levels. And on the other hand, an economy that grows faster, with higher employment levels, but is less governable, and less as less privileged classes are positioned to uh, demand a larger share, share of income. Let's turn now to the period after the second synthesis and the Ricardian equivalence. For these reasons, Keynesian ideas were fiercely contested from the very beginning of the political, uh, in the political arena in the name of uh, laissez-faire. On the theoretical front, it wasn't until the 1970s that a radically anti-Kinsian approach gained prominence following, following an article by Robert Barrow in 1974. This approach, combined with a series of other uh, theoretical innovations, led to a counter-revolution that returned macroeconomics to a pre-Kinsian era. The new classical macroeconomics argued that Kinsian policy was ineffective, seen as a purely inflationary as purely inflationary, and the multiplier was supposed to be nearly uh, zero. The idea put forth by the theory of Ricardian equivalence by Barrow is that an increase in government spending would lead to a decrease in, pri in private spending, thus cancelling the multiplier effect. This would be a complete crowding out of private spending by government spending. Beyond these initial functions, uh, sorry, beyond its essential functions, public spending would be considered pointless. These extreme ideas did not have a, dir a direct e impact on uh, economic policy. For example, despite its laissez-faire orientation and neoliberal view, Reaganomics in the United States heavily relied on Keynesian principles to first curb inflation by stopping demand, which would restore profits, and then to, quick, to kickstart the economy with great success through the military industrial complex and its Star Wars project, ultimately leading to the exhaustion of the Soviet competitor. 
this very Keynesian, though not social democratic, stimulus paved the way for the remarkable rise in the information economy and the dot-com bubble in the 1990s, which marked the success of the Clinton years. China rode this wave and began its impressive industrialization at that period. And the emergence of artificial intelligence today in a, is a more distant outcome of this. However, in the academic realm, the ideas of the new classical macroeconomics were integrated in the 80s as part of the second synthesis of neo-Kinsian thought, which dominated macroeconomics until the early 2010s. This body of thought abandoned the idea of demon stimulation in favor of a more subdued form of Keynesianism, pr primarily playing out in the short term through automatic stabilizer, Fine-tuning prim primarily relied on monetary policy with a focus on inflation targeting, which presented itself during this period as the main tool of economic policy. The assumption was that the government could only act in a limited way. In the case of a recession, until, uh, until the economy returned to its long-term trajectory, which was assumed to be determined solely by institutional elements related, related to market fluidity and, oper and operability, as well as technological progress assumed to be exogenous. The multiplier was thus assumed to be zero or very low, regardless of the economist's position in the business cycle. Austerity became a normal and permanent form of governance. This analytical framework served as a reference point for economic policy from the late uh, 1980s. An important fact to note is that during this period, the public debt to GDP ratio in advanced capitalist countries, all of which adopted this con these principles, continued to rise even though there was a tendency for, for it to decrease during the golden age of Keynesian policies. This occurred despite a sustained decline in real interest rates in the early 90s, which eventually reached negative levels 30 years later, including long-term rates. This point is, over, is often overlooked, yet it is essential because the second synthesis predicts an inverse relationship between long-term interest rates and the level of debt, which is not what, we, uh, what was observed. After the extraordinary global finan financial class, uh, crisis of 2008, an old-fashioned Keynesian stimulus, that is demand-driven, took place successfully in 2009 in the core economies of the capitalist world. However, as of uh, 2010, relying on the principles of the second synthesis, the IMF, OECD, European Commission, and many other entities recommended ending this stimulus out of fear of endangering public finances and returning to the principles of budget consolidation until the Biden plan was launched in early 2021. This resulted in a very low growth and an inability for these countries to significantly reduce their debt to GDP ratios. Only Germany and its satellites, through an exceptional export orientation and neo-mercantilism, neo managed to, far, to fare well. The reduction in its autonomous public spending was partially offset by its ex exports, allowing it to drastically reduce its uh, public debt ratio despite a modest internal growth rate. Challenges to Ricardian equivalence. During this period, the economics profession and what is known as the mainstream has changed significantly since the 1990s. For better or worse, theorists have been gradually replaced by econometricians. The rise of empiricism facilitated by technological advancement in software and computer processing power forced the profession to return to the real world. This is particularly true in microeconomics, which has seen the gradual disappearance of the old neoclassical theory based on axiomatic and a prioristic foundations. 
in favor of a more behavioral and pragmatic approach. But this shift has also manifested in macroeconomics, especially concerning the issue of the multiplier. In the first decade of the millennium, there was a proliferation of publications demonstrating that the multiplier is not always as negligible as suggested by the theory of Ricardian equivalence adopted by the second synthesis. More and more colleagues who nevertheless worked within the, new, the theoretical framework of the second synthesis observed that the multiplier is often greater than 0 0.5 and even equals or exceeds 1. Some publications even found much higher levels beyond two in certain cir circumstances and depending on the, uh, the size and characteristics of the country or region under consideration. Another discovery or rediscovery, since uh, this was well known in the 60s, in the 1960s, is that the size of the multiplier varies depending on uh, where the economy stands in the business cycle. It's related to the output gap. In other words, it tends to increase as the economy moves away from its potential growth path. This means that the impact of an increase in autonomous demand on growth is more significant when growth is low. In such cases, if private investment doesn't pick, doesn't pick up, fiscal policy regains its importance in restoring economic activity and improving employment levels. This essentially constitutes the rediscovery of the multiplier. However, this wasn't enough to prevent the serious mistake of endorsing uh, consolidation in 2010 during uh, an economic st uh, stimulus. It wasn't until January 2013 that a turning point occurred. Blanchard and Ley, uh, Blanchard was then uh, the chief economist at the IMF and an architect of the second synthesis acknowledged in a nine-page working paper that the 2010 decisions were based on an incorrect estimate of the ordinary multiplier. They indicated that a multiplier of 1.5 would have been used instead, uh, should have been used instead of 0.5. The stakes were high, and this small technical note signaled uh, to the global community of economists that the reference model needed to be revised to re-emphasize the role of the multiplier and re-evaluate the concept of Ricardian equiv equivalence. The third synthesis now. Since that date, mainstream macroeconomics has become more Keynesian once again with a neo-Keynesian model in which households may not act in a Ricardian manner when they face income constraints, which is often the case. In, a, in other words, the model no longer assumes that households consistently reduce their consumption when the government increases its spending. In essence, this third synthesis aligns more closely with post-Keynesian theory, which has remained very close to Keynes' original message. The primary remaining distinction, since there are other differences we don't have the time to discuss here, between these two streams, is not, uh, enter, it's, and it's not entirely, entirely clear which one is uh, the mainstream now, concerns long-term dynamics. The third synthesis continues to assert, to assert that long-term ter, uh, long growth is not contingent on short-term fluctuations. Thus, this is determined by economic structures and exogenous technical progress. In contrast, post-Kinsians can now model the institutions of John Robinson, 1956, the intuitions, no, not the institutions, sorry. So post-Kinsian can now model the intuitions of John Robinson and emphasize that long-term dynamics have the same properties as short-term dynamics and depend on short-term events. In other words, for post-Kinsians, a decline in accumulation today, if it persists, will reduce the future growth capacity and future employment levels. This precise element is denied by the third synthesis. 
There is, uh, there is no endogenous mechanism that automatically ensures for post-Kinsian economists uh, the economy, that the economy will return to its initial long-term growth path. In the post-Kinsian framework, the government's role is not only to stabilize the economy uh, in the short term, but also to prepare for future growth through forward-looking public investments. This aligns with the old Schumpeterian idea that technological progress is endogenous to accumulation. Big question now, how to reduce the debt to GDP ratio? How to improve the sustainability of public debt if austerity doesn't work? I know that I might make enemies on both sides, assuming there are only both sides, only two sides, and maybe friends on both sides too. Who knows? Keep in mind that I will uh, quickly address questions that would require several hours of discussion to delve into the details and accuracy of uh, arguments. Any solution to public finance involves change in the macro trajectory. Taxes. In the scenario where the tax structure is flat, which means neither progressive nor regressive, Raising the level of deductions will harm the poorest individuals who will consume less, resume, uh, reducing over overall demand. On the other hand, the wealthiest won't, signific won't significantly reduce their consumption, but this will lower their propensity to save. At the aggregate level, there will be a decrease in the average propensity to save, which will increase the multiplier effect of autonomous spending. If, uh, in this case, if the increase in deduction results in an equivalent increase in autonomous spending, there will be a decrease in the debt to GDP ratio. Increasing the progressivity of the tax system. This means, uh, this is also something that could or should be done to reduce the debt to GDP ratio. This means increasing the tax rate more on wealthier households uh, with through positive, uh, progressive ta uh, income tax uh, uh, by brackets. At the aggregate level, this further reduces the, uh, the aggregate propensity to save, which increases the multiplier effect even more. The combination of these two factors involves political feasibility because these measures are very unpopular. They have an indirect financial effect. Sorry. They have an indirect uh, financial effect. If these measures are not to disincentive, which would reduce the tax base, they will lead to medium-term induced revenue influx, which will also reduce the deficit. The decrease in the debt-to-GDP ratio will lead to a, uh, will lead to a decrease in long-term interest rates, freeing up budgetary flexibility. Therefore, it is necessary to proceed with political tact and discernment to avoid rebellion and tax evasion. In the background, the challenge is the quality of the tax administration and the, intelli the intelligence of the political discourse that accompanies such measures, which must appeal to civic duty, the sense of the common good, national solidarity, and the importance of preparing the future. Two words on reducing inequalities now. Reducing inequalities helps reduce the debt to GDP ratio because it leads to a decrease in the average propensity to save, which increases the size of the multiplier. However, this is not a short-term variable. It is related to the progressivity of the tax structure and the development strategy, and we don't have time to develop these aspects today, unfortunately. Taking action on imports. Reducing the propensity to import increases the size of the multiplier and thus reduces the debt-to-GDP ratio as long as autonomous demand increases. This involves improving the diversification of the, the economy, which is part of a long-term development strategy. Implementing import quotas can be a very unpopular and can limit production, making it uh, not a very good solution unless import restrictions are targeted at non-essential goods. Exports. Increasing the propensity to export increases the multiplier, which is, uh, but this is a viable, uh, sorry, but this viable is difficult to manipulate in the short run, 
and medium term as well. It depends in part on the development strategy and therefore on public investments. Two words on non-macro elements. They are super important, but I don't have the time to develop. Eradicating corruption and state capture and improving the quality of administration and services rendered enhances the macro level effectiveness of all the measures we are discussing. And let's go back to, my, to the main argument. Public autonomous spending. This is the key point. The solution is simple. Instead of hitting the brakes, you need to hit the accelerator. So the, the problem is political. There is no economic problem. It's all about politics and how people react on this notion. So then, if you hit the accelerator, you make use of the multiplier and thus increase uh, the GDP faster than that. Do not be deterred by the fact that the initial spending is financed by debt. Select the most efficient expenditures in terms of the multiplier, and it works. Do not confuse autonomous spending with ordinary spending, those that already exist. Also, do not confuse them with redistribution expenditures, which have a low multiplier effect and do not prepare for the future. So the key variable is investment. The rest of our discussion on the counterparts of debt will delve into this crucial concept. It can be shown quite easily that the size of the multiplier required to reduce the debt to GDP ratio is inversely related to the initial debt ratio. So if you ask what is the required size of the multiplier to, to obtain this result, then there is a fantastic news. The higher the, the, the debt level, the easier it is to reduce, sorry, I went too fast. Uh, the, the higher the debt, uh, the debt level, the easier it is to reduce the debt to, uh, to GDP ratio by increasing autonomous public spending financed by debt. However, the higher the interest rate, the less feasible this strategy becomes. Coordination with the monetary authorities who are a legal, a legal state or a regalian entity is essential. The debt reduction strategy can fail due to a lack of coordination between these two arms of the state. Uh, sorry, I went too fast. The central bank must support the government in its strategy. It can either directly finance the state or buy treasury bonds on the second market to lower long-term interest rates. This will, of course, have an impact on the exchange rate, inflation, and the balance of payments, but we don't have the time to discuss these elements in detail today. There is no other recipe, no magic wand. You, want, you must combine these elements to move forward. Other methods are deadly and ineffective. Let's discuss the counterparts of public debt now. We are now in the final part of this presentation. Not exactly the final one. In the final one, I will discuss uh, the case of South Africa. Public debt allows the balancing of the public budget in order to carry out sovereign expenses and, ex and implement economic policies. The focus here is on discussing the economic effects and social utility of expenses um, permitted by debt. We will set aside financial aspects and the liability side of public administration's balance sheets. We are concerned with the asset uh, in the broader sense of the public administration's balance sheet. Since Adam Smith, the traditional normative uh, view of public finance considers that uh, government's current expenses are based on, tax, uh, on, on revenue, on taxes. Furthermore, the collection of taxes enable the state to borrow on financial markets. Through borrowing, the state can spend more than the annual revenue, provided it can pay the interest rate on the debt and also refinance new debt when repaying the old one. Taxes are a Sorry, taxes play a crucial role in reassuring lenders about the public actor's ability to perform these two operations. Public debt is therefore backed by taxation. 
In his discussion of public investment, Adam Smith deem, deems it essential for the state to handle the production and financing of public goods. These are goods, um, sorry, these are goods with positive spillovers on the world economy, and he particularly spoke of transportation infrastructure, roads, bridges, ports, these, infra these elements that connect markets and significantly boost economic activity. Such goods being uh, challenging to make profitable for the private sector for a multitude of reasons we don't have time to detail here would not be produced if the state did not take responsibility. Moreover, given their positive impact on economic activity, these expenses lead to increased growth and consequently future tax revenues. Therefore, Smith said it's appropriate to borrow to finance the, such expenses, which can have a very high price tag. Such expenses can, can be amortized over a long period without endangering public finances. We have seen that these institutions have been confirmed, these intuitions, sorry, have been confirmed by modern macroeconomics due to the multiplier effect, an idea that Smith had already intuited 250 years ago. Public investment, in the narrow sense, referred as to gross fixed capital formation, GFCF, is thus a very good reason for incurring debt because it is beneficial for the entire economy and in return, it improves public finances through the, result, the, result, the resulting increase in tax revenue. One can then compare the stock of public debt to the stock of public capital and see how it evolves, and we will see this in a minute regarding South Africa. Debt with only public assets as a counterpart is a very virtuous and high quality debt. For this reason, it has little chance, chance of leading to a sustainable uh, uh, increase in the debt to GDP ratio. However, we should not have a restrictive view of what is referred to as public uh, investment. National accounting limits uh, it to GFCF, but the definition of GFCF has evolved and thankfully so. For over a century, economists have considered research and development as investment expenditures because they prepare for the future and contribute to increasing growth potential by renewing processes and accelerating technological progress. Nevertheless, research and development expenses were only included in the definition of GFCF in the system of national accounts by the United Nations just a decade ago. This illustrates that we cannot solely rely on accounting conventions. It was no less legitimate to spend on research and development 30 years ago than it is today. Therefore, it is too restrictive to consider that public deficit should only cover strictly accounted investment since many expenditures similar to investments are not classified as such. And let's explore this further quickly. Higher education. Going back to research and development where the public sector plays the role of long-term investor upstream, it is the sole funder of fundamental research while the private sector concentrates more on development and finalization of processes downstream. Both are highly complementary. Public research and development is largely carried out in universities like WITS, which are involved in both research and education. Higher education raises the skill levels of the population and enhances the growth potential of the entire economy. 
public funds allocated to universities in the broad sense are not included in research and development. It, is it illegitimate for the nation to go into debt to improve its higher education system, especially when it is considered economically rational for individuals to borrow money for their education? Absolutely not. One can then attend attempt to assess the quality of public debt by comparing it to the evolution of spending on higher education, which is an addition to GFCF in our demonstration. As long as public debt increases to enable the realization of such counterparts, there is no need to worry about debt's sustainability. Education and health. Should we stop there and appreciate the trajectory of public debts? No, we just discussed higher education as a way to prepare for the future and as a form of quasi-investment. In fact, for at least 60 years, economists have regarded education as an intangible investment in individuals. They even speak of human capital. The term has become common in our profession, even though, of course, we all know that it's not quite like physical capital as you cannot sell it like a machine. Nevertheless, education helps improve the quality of the workforce for production and research and development. Therefore, education is indeed a form of investment in people that prepares for the future, increases growth potential, and thus makes that more sustainable in the long run. Economists have also developed similar arguments about healthcare expenditures, improving the health of our citizen in an, uh, 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 is the idea is that it's an end in itself, similar to education, but from an economic sense standpoint, it means enhancing the quality of the workforce, increasing health, healthy lifespans, and reducing costs associated with illness, aging, disability, etc. Let's move further and have a broader view. Expenditures that prepare for the future. We can see that there is a very wide range of beneficial expenditures that can be likened to a form of investment with the property of expanding the tax base in the long term and thus ensuring sustainability. These expenditures can serve, can serve as a good counterpart to public debt, extending beyond gross fixed capital formation. This doesn't imply that all of these expenditures should be entirely financed by debt, of course, which wouldn't be feasible. But it does suggest that if borrowing allows for the promotion of these expenditures, it is a good thing. The question that arises is the displacement of these expenditures by others that do not prepare for the future. For example, during a severe crisis, the government has the role in making emergency expenditures and borrowing is justified. And it happened. However, once the crisis has passed, if the expenditures is that, prepares, that prepare for the future are no longer carried out, the situation will not improve and the emergency will persist. This can lead to bad debt akin to gambling debt with no counterpart, which uh, becomes increasingly unsustainable as it relies on a tax base in constant erosion. Back to macroeconomics now before discussing the South African case. Let's conclude this presentation with a broader reflection that returns to macroeconomics. Ultimately, what really matters at the aggregate level is the effect of economic policy, not on public finances, but on macroeconomic dynamics, on businesses, households, and uh, society as a whole. Macroeconomic dynamics are the counterpart of debt dynamics. One doesn't go without the other. Is the, general, is the government borrowing to improve the labor market situation and, as a, re as a result, bequeath to future generations a higher level of employment? Is the government borrowing to implement an economic policy that reduces inequalities and increases the standard of living of all citizens or just for a minority? 
is the government borrowing to enhance the conditions for business development, promote exports, and diversify the economy sufficiently to be less dependent on the rest of the world, etc. If these elements improve, sustainability will improve. Deciding economic policy solely to improve public finance makes no sense and doesn't lead to success. Economic policy only makes sense to set a specific trajectory for the economy itself. It is, a f it is from this perspective that the South African situation should be analyzed. If the trajectory is unfavorable, it's simply because the policy choices aren't correct and vice versa. Regarding South Africa, now to finish this lecture, it's been a bit long, I apologize for that. Now it's gonna be very quick. Uh, regarding South Africa, uh, there are bad news and also good news. The bad news, the debt to GDP ratio has gone up during the last decade. The issue is not the level, but the trajectory. You probably all know that. The other bad news is that the debt is more and more disconnected from the stock of public capital and infrastructures in the narrow sense. That's all for bad news. <laughs> Another not very good news, I don't call it a bad news, <laughs> is that the stock of capital per head has stalled. But the not that bad news is that it hasn't decreased. So the potential is still there. Another not that bad news or not that good news is that the government uh, research development uh, spending in GDP terms has eroded too much, probably. So all this is easily understandable, as we can see here. Uh, the, the public uh, GFCF, the public investment, has increased systematically slower than GDP for a good decade. So, the public capital remains more or less constant while the debt per capita increases, and this is what we can see on this chart. If we compare now public deficit to GFCF, we see in this chart that the process is discontinuous. The deterioration occurred in stages with, of course, an acceleration, not of course, an acceleration in 2018 and, of course, a peak with the COVID crisis, and then it's going down again, which is very good news. The good news now. The good news, fortunately, uh, uh, is that fortunately this is compensated, at least partially, by the fact that education, health, and social protection per head have increased during this period. However, social protection should not be seen as, as an investment in individuals like education and health. It is more about redistribution, redistributing income, and needs to be funded through taxation or social contributions. Otherwise, it would not be viable, sustainable uh, on the long run. So the debt has increased faster than these three elements, which raises questions about the government's ability to continue on this path which doesn't appear to be sustainable. Nothing is set in stone. Any trajectory can be changed. Even if it's not easy, 
even if it's not immediate. South Africa still has tremendous potential. There is no economic inevitability. A new political coalition must emerge to implement different economic policy choices, which will lead to a different macro trajectory and different public debt trajectory. Thank you for your attention and patience. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, Prof. Stevens. I can see you're stronger than me. It is my privilege this evening to extend the vote of thanks on this momentous occasion of the inaugural lecture by Professor Tinell. First and foremost, I must extend our deepest appreciation to Professor Tinell for delivering a stellar lecture this evening on the timely and pertinent topic of public debt dynamics between finance, macroeconomics, and politics. The lecture has underscored the importance of responsible and sustainable fiscal management, while emphasizing that austerity is not always the answer. Bruno has unpacked various schools of thought towards debt management and approaches to debt and the empirical approaches used by various major economies across the world. I think the central message that has come through is what matters is the quality of debt. And as long as debt is an investment towards gross fixed capital formation, it is after all not necessarily such a bad thing. It is clear that government revenue that is available for investment needs to be into productive and, as mentioned, public good investments. And debt levels should not be allowed to reach such an unsustainable level where revenue goes fundamentally into servicing of debt. Bruno has highlighted this evening the need to ensure that austerity should not lead to economic slowdown, which can basically boomerang and further increase debt-GDP ratio. Interestingly, Professor Tunnell has shown us South African data and the trajectory which of course resonates closely with that of Geeta Gopinath, the IMF first deputy managing director. In a recent visit to the School of Economics and Finance, she shared the IMF projection that the cost of government debt could rise from its current 19% to 27% of revenue by 2028, and that the interest bill on South Africa's public debt burden could balloon to more than twice the size of the health budget in the next five years. So these are issues of concern. But as Bruno highlighted, the government needs to focus on increasing autonomous investment. Investment that would have the highest multiplier effect and will result in crowding in of private investment as well. Professor Tunnell also touched upon this evening the various ways in which debt-GDP ratio could be reduced. And to mention some of them is, of course, to increase the progressivity of tax rates, reducing inequality, reduce import propensity while increasing exports, and, of course, very importantly, ensuring good governance. No doubt, balancing the need for social and infrastructure development with the imperative of fiscal responsibility is a complex challenge. Bruno touched upon the need for a comprehensive approach towards curbing, ballooning, and out-of-hand public debt. And for this, 
he emphasized the need for both fiscal policy and monetary policy to be in sync. Of course, this requires thoughtful policy decisions and a concerted effort to return South Africa to a sustainable fiscal path. Professor Tinell's extensive research and profound expertise have provided us with a deeper understanding of the intricate relationship between public debt, economic stability, and political decision-making. Professor Tinell, your lecture this evening has been a true eye-opener, and we are profoundly grateful for your contribution to our knowledge. There is no doubt that today's lecture has made valuable contribution to policy debate, which I'm sure will carry on um, later on outside of this room as well. My sincere thanks to the DVC, Professor Garth Stevens, Pro Vice Chancellor Imran Valodia, and the Dean of CLM Faculty, Professor Cohen, for gracing this occasion this evening. It is wonderful to see Bruno's family here, Alice, Colin, Zach, and Milo, present to share Bruno's achievement. You can all be so proud of him. Also, my sincere thanks to all the colleagues from School of Economics and Finance and WITS University and outside WITS University present here today to share the event. Lastly, my gratitude to the events office for organizing the event. With that, we end today's proceedings and invite all of you to join for refreshments in the foyer and congratulate Professor Tinell in person. May I now request the audience to stand up as the procession leaves the room. Thank you.